Um, we're going to call this meeting to order now. Um, it is May 3rd, 2023, and this is a public meeting of the Settlement and Policy Subcommittee of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. Um, so let's start off with introductions, and I will at this time hand it over to our two co-chairs of the subcommittee, Ann Campbell and Pastor Robin Wisner. Good evening, everyone. Ann Campbell, I use she, her pronouns. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, I've been a PSEP member since uh, right before the murder of George Floyd, and I've used um, the space here to help uh, uplift the issues that um, that are affecting our marginalized Black and Brown community members. Pastor Wisner. Hello again, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, I am Pastor Robin Wisner, uh, the co-chair of the Settlement and Policy, as well as uh, co-chair of the uh, PSEP full committee. I want to first, uh, out of proper uh, protocol of my culture, as well as my clergy, I acknowledge my senior here, uh, Dr. Leroy Haynes, who has joined us. Um, Again, uh, a very much so historical figure that has fought for many of what we're looking for uh, in his great wisdom on today in the, this, this great discussion, this robust discussion. Um, I also uh, like to say about Dr. Haynes is that I have spoke with him earlier and I would like to say to those um, that are here, we're fighting in the era of today justice, such as what we are being acquainted to from the settlement that brought the agreement that uh, came to the city of Portland uh, with all of the shootings here. But Dr. Haynes' history uh, goes back to Carmel, Carmel, Michael Carmel of uh, SNCC, as well as with Dr. King. So we have with us someone who is truly wisdom for those who would like to know more and understand if we listen to the wisdom of what is more needed in today's fight for justice. Again, I want to thank him and all of you uh, who are here today uh, for this great discussion. I'll pass it over to, um, I see, Nathan. Thank you, Pastor Weisner. Uh, hi, everyone. Nathan Castle, uh, he, him pronouns. I joined PSEP uh, last year, um, coming on a year now, actually, on, on PSEP. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it to, I think, Gloria. Yes. Thank you, Nathan. I'm Gloria Canson. I'm a representative of uh, the Settlement and Agreement um, Committee. And I'm, I'm just glad to be here. I'm hoping that I'll be able to share and hopefully um, I can pass on some information. Thank you. And I think Leslie is here as well. I didn't see her. But... Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Leslie Martinez. I'm a member of PSEP. My pronouns are she, her. And I actually joined piece up around the same time as Nathan. So I'm also coming up on uh, being a member for a year. Um, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. I think that's all of our subcommittee members here. So uh, this time we can have um, any city staff, um, city attorney's office, uh, DOJ, PPB, Cocal um, representatives introduce themselves. Um, I will start. I'm Dori Grubinski, PSEP project manager. Um, glad to be here with you all. And anyone else can jump in. Hi, I'm Heidi Brown. I'm with the city attorney's office. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm happy to be here with all of you tonight. And great to see you, Dr. Haynes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jared Hager. I'm a trial attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice. 
I use he, him pronouns, and I appreciate you inviting me here today. Thank you. Good evening. It's Mary Claire Buckley, and I work at the Portland Police Bureau. Thanks for the invite. Dr. Rosenblum, do you want to introduce yourself? Let me try. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I had trouble using the internet tonight, and so I'm using some small little computer here that I can't, uh, not used to. Uh, Dennis Rosenbaum, uh, use he, him pronouns. It's uh, great to be here this evening. Thank you very much. With that being said, I guess we can go, Dory, into our um, uh, community agreement and agenda for tonight. Um, I will ask um, if Leslie wouldn't mind volunteering for us tonight. Yeah, I can do that. Um, community agreements. Listen actively and respectfully. Share airtime. Be present and open to new information and perspectives. Assume positive intent. Respect each other. Respect the group. Speak your own truth. Communicate directly, honestly, and respectfully. Ask questions to clarify. Call out bias and be okay with ambiguity. Excellent. Um, so our overviews for today's meeting. Um, Dory, did you want to? Uh, go over you, you go right ahead all right great then so today um we're looking and want to thank again everyone for being here for this great discussion and then also i would like to come in um say hello to heidi i see there um and the city on um the work that has been set forth in uh where we have come today um with such a long time and uh, Jared as well, um, to be able to um, get to this place before we move, had to move into arbitration. Um, I think that there is a lot of interest tonight and in, um, just like it was at the council meeting uh, with a lot of input and I'm sure we're going to have a great discussion. Uh, but the overview for tonight um, uh, we'll have updates, um, then we'll go into the body-worn camera policy and um, pilot, and then we'll take a 10-minute break and then discuss discussion on the contract survey, and then we'll have open public comment. Uh, next slide. And for community updates, um, A uh, community forum on the COCL replacement, COCO replacement, uh, week 15, um, um, week of the May 15th. Uh, it will be host City Hall, the city, and the DOJ. Yeah, um, excuse me, sorry about my phone here. Uh, community forum on the uh, 15th, and the city of top hosting two top candidates to present the community and answering questions. Next slide there. Can I jump in when you're done too, uh, Pastor Wisner? You may. Uh, if you'd like to go before I go into the city and DOJ mediation over an independent monitoring issue. These are all updates. Go ahead. And. Oh, I just wanted to um, say that tonight, uh, Pastor Weisner is going to be facilitating the first part of our meeting, uh, and then I am going to be facilitating the second part with uh, Dr. Rosenbaum. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I always uh, need some help here. I appreciate you uh, so much uh, as a co-chair with me, uh, and uh, the part of where that we are really working strong together and um, trying to create a great discussion for the community and um, 
not so much heavy on one or the other, uh, but sharing it. Uh, the next slide. Uh, PSEP recommendation to appoint an independent monitor in the settlement agreement was approved um, by Celeste Robin and uh, Leslie Martinez, Ashley Schofield, Gloria Byron, and Tia. On some, and it was submitted on March the 6th, 2023. And response was due on May 5th of 2023. Um, next slide, please. Can I ask a quick question? I don't mean to interrupt. Um, Dory, just for clarification, so we have not received a response uh, on that as of yet. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's what I'm highlighting for you all here. So um, we can expect a response. Um, the deadline uh, should be this Friday, actually. Thank you for pointing that out. That's very important. And again, thank you. Uh, any other discussions before we go into it about the independent monitoring? Any other questions or thoughts, Anne? No, thank you. Okay, just to give an update a little bit again about the body warm camera policy and agreement uh, and pilot. Um, Heidi did a great job at the uh, city council meeting on uh, informing uh, the community on the uh, policy. Um, next slide. I'm going to ask um, to give a little background on where we were and a little background on the policy itself of the body worn camera. The city and the uh, Portland Police Association came to an agreement on the uh, body worn camera policy a year long after a year long impasse. And body worn cameras added to the settlement agreement in 2021 after the Department of Justice found that the city and Portland Police were out of compliance. This agreement means that the policy will not be going to arbitration. Uh, the staking points has been um, pre, the sticking points have been uh, around the pre review uh, of the uh, officers uh, taking their statements, whether they allow the officer who used deadly forces to view the camera footage before they're writing their report or being in, interviewed. Uh, these have been uh, some real strong concerns throughout the community, as well as what we've heard about other um, uh, points to the policy. Now, piece of recommendations from the Body Worn Camera had a town hall in February 2022. Um, the PBB sh um, point one of the recommendation was PBB should be transparent in how officers for the pilot projects are selected. Officers for the pilot project should be randomly selected. This will alleviate the perceptions that officers are handpicked for the project based on behavior and other position or positive factors that could influence the results. The second um, point of the recommendation was we strongly recommended body camera footage be stored uh, by an independent third party. Third, officers should write their report before viewing um, the camera footage. This would avoid officers tailoring their account of the incident based on what the footage shows. The fourth recommendation was strict discipline for officers who turned off their cameras um, when they are supposed to be engaged. Uh, this should include the possibility of termination. The fifth recommendation was public access to the video should be accessible to all individ individuals in regarding to the disability 
in exception, including the ADA uh, assessable. So I think um, this takes us to the discussion tonight, uh, where we are today, and we have um, Heidi, uh, Chief Deputy of City Attorney, with us tonight. Uh, Derek Hager, also uh, the Assistant U.S. Dis DOJ, and Dr. Uh, Leroy Haynes of Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition. Um, so um, how I think we should go into this is a little background. Heidi, um, well, let's go start here. What are the details of the agreement and how the pilot will work? I'm going to ask Heidi, um, if you don't mind, um, coming in and presenting um, some of those fine points of the agreement or the policy uh, that was um, presented to the city council. Great. Um, thank you, Pastor Weidner. Always great to see you and Ann and Gloria. I hope I didn't miss anyone that I know, but it's great to see everyone. Um, thanks again for having me tonight. And um, what I'll do is go through, I did a presentation at council. I What I tried to do when I did that presentation was really pare down to the essential elements of the policy. And, um, and so what I'd like to do is go ahead and go through those points. Um, and so hopefully it's not too redundant for any of you who might have been at the council session. And please feel free to I, I, well, I'll defer to you, Pastor Widener, on how you want to handle it. If somebody has a question or doesn't understand something and wants me to expand on that, I will defer to you on how you want to handle that. Um, and we will take those um, after um, everyone. Great. Thank you. Um, one thing that I think is really great for uh, and important for people to know is that at the beginning of, um, I think, all PPB directives, there is a policy purpose. And in this policy purpose, there's a number of things I've mentioned. There's like four paragraphs within there. But I thought it what what was important and stood out and I thought was something that would resonate with the community and that we as the city included in there, both for city council and their interests mm -hmm. in the interests of the city and, and citywide, but also in the interest of the community was acknowledging that body cameras are an accountability tool and that they really do help enhance transparency and increase understanding of interactions between officers and the public. And our hope is that they help police in building and maintaining public trust. Um, then we got into in the policy of who wears these. Uh, and we tried to be relatively broad with it, all on duty sworn members in a uniform assignment displaying a badge, who take part in CERT, so that's the Special Emergency Response Team, who are part of patrol or traffic, public order event operations, and special duty work for secondary employers. We also said any officer who's not in uniform who's engaging in police action is required to wear them. We did include within the policy an adjustment period for unintentional errors. So for the first 60 days that an officer is wearing a body camera, if they um, if they forgot to dock their camera at the end of their shift, um, so it didn't charge and upload, uh, that would be something that they would not get, be subject to discipline for during that first 60 day period. Thereafter, intentional error, uh, thereafter then, they're liable to the policy as, as written. But we also made clear that during that first 60 days, if somebody is engaging in an intentional error and misconduct, they are subject to discipline, regardless of that, regardless of whether it's in the first 60 days or after the first 60 days, that always applies. So the next thing that we discussed in the policy is notification. Um, the officers are required to notify people that they are being recorded. Then we got into activation. At what point do officers need to activate their cameras? So, so 
the cameras are interesting. They you they get powered on, and at that point, once they're powered on, they're not recording. They're just in standby mode. And so we were listing out at what point does the officer have to turn it on to start recording? What we said was there are various times when they will have to be manually activated, but there's also times that for these particularly bo particular body cameras that we are piloting and that we um, will potentially enter into a long-term contract with, that they have an auto activation feature. So when certain things happen, they just automatically turn them on. There's a Bluetooth trigger that gets activated. So those automatic activation turns on when one, they turn on, the officer turns on their overhead lights, the body camera is going to start. Two is when an officer takes out their taser, again, the body camera will just start recording. And then the third instance where they offer automatic activation is when they draw their firearm. And again, that will automatically activate. And one thing I didn't say in council, but that's a little interesting is that the, the way that the axon automatic activation works is it sends out a Bluetooth signal when the trigger event occurs. So when the overhead lights are turned on, when somebody's pulling it out of the taser uh, holster or when somebody's pulling it out of the firearm holster, it sends out this Bluetooth signal of approximately 30 feet. And any other axon body cameras that are within that, that rate radius is also automatically activated. So if there's a number of officers around and somebody does one thing and activates, automatically activates, everybody is just gonna turn on. This next part is about manual activation. When are officers required to turn it on themselves? So first we said when they are dispatched on a call. So as soon as they get the dispatch from our 911 mm -hmm. dispatchers, they, they need to turn, turn on their cameras. The second uh, uh, instance when we said they need to turn on their cameras is when they're engaging with the public during a protest. We did put a caveat because there is um, there are some legal limitations on recording people engaged in protests. And so the limitation we put is provided that it's allowed by law. So as long as the law allows for officers to turn on their cameras during a protest event, they will be required to do so. And we'll address that during training to make sure that officers understand what the legal uh, limitations are around turning on cameras during protests. The next instance is when someone, uh, when they're pulling someone over either in their car or if they're stopping a pedestrian, uh, they will be required to activate their camera. When they're asking for consent to search or attempting to do a search, again, they're required to turn on the camera. We said for certain custodial interviews of uh, juveniles, and this is a state law requirement, then they're required to um, turn 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 that on. Um, and then the last is also under state law for for body cameras, is when the member develops reasonable suspicion or probable cause to believe that a crime or a violation either has occurred is occurring or will occur, and the member begins to make contact with the person suspected of committing the offense. So that is that is state law requires uh, officers to turn their cameras on when uh, a, a police agency has body cameras. So those are the six instances when manual activation is required. We do have exceptions. Um, times when they can either mute their camera or mute their camera. So the cameras turn on and they have video and audio. And um, they they can be muted so that you'll still see the audio, but you won't hear the, um, excuse me, I said you still see the audio. You'll still see the video, uh, but you will not hear the audio. So that's muting. So there's, we had listed out rare instances when the officer can mute. Uh, their cameras, so there'll be video but no audio, and other instances where they would deactivate their camera. Um, so for an, a couple examples of when an officer must deactivate their camera is when interviewing a sexual assault victim, although we did say that they need to let the sexual assault victim know that if they would um, like them to turn their camera back on, they're more than happy to do so, uh, but they just need consent from a sexual assault victim to turn it, turn it on. 
And then the other instance was in the medical facility. We addressed then when they should stop recording. And we said, you'll stop recording when the contact with the person concludes or when you're done participating in a call for service. We then went through the upload and storage of the footage. So on the upload, that occurs at the end of the sh shift. And we also put in a special provision for a deadly force situation because officers who are involved in deadly force, uh, involved members in a deadly force instance, they uh, are sent home on administrative leave. And so in that instance, the supervisor will take the camera and ensure that the footage is uploaded. For storage, uh, we, we, we just wanted to make it clear in the policy. And this was um, you know, something that I felt was important for the public to see. And I think the union felt was important for their members to know that body cameras do not allow for tampering with, manipulating or altering content or deleting recordings. Um, so we put that right in the policy. I will tell you that the Axon cameras that we are piloting, it is not, it, there's no way to get inside that camera to change the footage in any way. Um, the other thing that I thought was important for folks to know, and I think uh, was important for us when, when we were deciding uh, what body camera to go with, was the fact that Axon system creates an audit, audit trail. So anytime someone looks at the body camera footage, um, there will be a capturing of that access. So let's say I went, uh, let's say I was an officer and I had some body camera footage and I went in to look at my own body camera footage in a situation where I was not allowed to, that information will be recorded that I accessed it. So um, there'll be an audit trail and, and anybody else who accessed it, there will be an audit trail. So we will know who accessed it and when. Um, then we get into, this was the, as Pastor Weisner said, this was the big um, challenge in bargaining that, um, that we had to work through, which was about reviewing of the body camera footage. And so the general policy is that officers may review their own body camera footage. And so oh, in, in all instances, unless we've accepted it, they can review their footage. The information we had received and in council's interest uh, was to have certain limitations on uses of force footage. So what we, what we limited on review of footage were in two categories of force. And the city of Portland is different than other places. Uh, not everybody has categories of force, but we do. And our category one use of force is deadly force. So that's an officer-involved shooting, uh, someone who dies while in custody, things of that nature. Um, and so just, just to know, some things that already exist are involved officers are directed not to talk about the matter. So that already exists. They're given a, a, an, a direct order saying you're not allowed to talk about this matter. They're placed, as I said earlier, on administrative leave, so they don't have access to the PPB um, records, evidence, et cetera, that's being collected either by detectives or by internal affairs. Um, within 48 hours, as I think most of you know, if not all, internal affairs is required to interview the involved officer. And that's something that was bargained with the union back in 2016 before I started working with, um, with the Bureau on Labor and Employment Matters. Uh, that, that interview is recorded and it always has been. So what we changed is this part which is that because now we have body camera, we're going to have body camera footage. So at the beginning of the interview, the officer, there'll be a written instruction given to the officer, which is part of a letter of agreement, not part of this policy, but the officer gives what we call a perceptual statement. The perceptual statement, we listed out what things are they going to address in that. They are, one, what brought them to the scene and what were their initial observations? Two, 
What were the person's demeanor, actions, and statements? Three, what was the threat posed by the person and or the nature of their resistance? Four, what were any warnings and or de-escalation tactics that the officer used before engaging in force? Five, what was the officer's force response? What did they do? And then six, what was any post-force medical aid? Because officers are required to give um, medical aid after a use of force. And so what was any medical aid that they provided after the use of force? Once the officer has addressed those, and if, if internal affairs uh, feels like the officer has not adequately addressed those six points, they can ask some follow-up questions. Once they've got that perceptual statement to everybody's satisfaction, then the officer, the involved officer with their union representative and the internal affairs investigators, investigators go into separate rooms and they each watch the involved officer's body camera footage at that point. Prior to that, neither of them will have watched the involved officer's body camera footage. Now, currently the internal affairs investigator gathers all evidence and looks at everything. So they will continue to do all of that. They will look at witness officers' body camera footage. They'll look at if there is a uh, convenience store and there's video, uh, whatever physical evidence is gathered by detectives. They will have all that information. The, the one thing that they won't have before they get this perceptual statement is they will not have looked at the involved officers body camera footage. So they go off into separate rooms, they each watch the footage, then they come back together and they discuss, internal affairs can ask any other questions they might wanna ask, but that's also an opportunity for the officer to explain if there are discrepancies between their perceptual statement and then they see the body camera footage and maybe there's something that's different or whatever might, whatever might occur. That's the opportunity for the officer to explain any discrepancy. So that's the process for the deadly force and in custody death. Um, anything under category one use of force, that's the process we're using for that. Then we also carved out category two uses of force. And category two uses of force, the, mainly those are force that force incidents that result in serious physical injury. But there are other things, and I'm just gonna give you like three other examples that are in the category two uses of force, but feel free if you, if you go onto Portland Police Bureau's website and you look for their directives, uh, you can look at directive 910 and directive 910 has all the categories of force. And then you could look at and see what else is in category two. But for today, the other, the other um, instances, a few other examples are when there's a use of force on a person who has an actual or perceived mental illness, that is considered a category two use of force or who are in a mental health crisis. And then any strike to someone who is handcuffed, that is automatically a category two use of force. Like I said, there's other ones in there as well, but those were just a few I wanted to point out to all of you. In the category two, when there's a category two use of force, the officer must provide a full and candid account. Now, to be clear, the full and candid account is already required under the DOJ settlement agreement and PPB policy. However, um, we put some meat on that by putting a little bargaining note on the side saying, this is an example of what a full and candid account might be. So, so previously the full and candid account has occurred verbally and it has not been recorded. And I call it the who, what, when, where, and how statement. Now, what will happen for category two uses of force is when the supervisor comes to the scene to take that full and candid account, the officer uh, will give it on the body camera of the supervisor. The officer can turn on their body camera as well, but prior to that, the officer will not review the body camera footage. Once they've given that who, what, when, where, how statement and provided what we, that full and candid account on the camera, 
then at that point, they can review their body camera footage and write their report. On categories three and four, so category three is a, a physical injury, but it's not serious. So if I got hit and I got a bruise or um, things of that nature, that's category three. And again, if you look in Directive 910 um, on the PPB website, you'll see, you'll see a full list of what all is encompassed in category three. And then category four is predominantly someone who's resisting handcuffing, um, who's um, um, maybe holding tight if they don't want their arms to be pulled out, um, but the person is not injured. And for those two types of force events, the officer is still required to provide a full and candid account, which, as I said, that's already required. But in that instance, that is not recorded on the supervisor's body camera. And then once they give that full and candid account, thereafter, they can review the footage and then they can write their report. Another, that's, that's the reviewing of the recordings. The next area that we were addressed was review of body camera footage by others. And we addressed three different uh, groups of folks that would have access to body camera footage of others. And one was a supervisor. So in all after action processes, the supervisor will always review body camera footage. And then we also said that for performance purposes, the Axon, Axon has a system where it will randomly select footage for a supervisor to review and the Supervisor will obtain randomly selected body camera footage from three events and will review that annually. So that's the supervisor. Second, we talked about training. And uh, for training purposes, body camera footage can be used. Uh, and ultimately, it's at the chief's discretion if uh, an officer disagrees with the use of that footage for training purposes. And then lastly, we addressed uh, for administrative investigations that officers can, um, can or excuse me, it, that it, internal affairs or other investigative bodies can access body camera footage for purposes of their investigations. Um, on records requests to the Portland Police Bureau, those will be handled by the records division. Um, and we did make clear uh, that the auditor and our office and other city offices will have access to body camera footage. Um, so that's the overview of the policy. I just really quickly in the letter of agreement, I do want to tell you we included written instructions that are given when interviewing an officer for use of deadly force or death in custody um, and listed out, that was um, an interest of the unions. And uh, it was in there that we discussed that it was clear that city bureaus and offices have access uh, to the body camera footage. And we also talked about the pilot program as a 60 day pilot program. Um, and at the end of that period, the city and the union can meet and discuss any mutual agree agreeable modifications to the policy, although that would, of course, require uh, approval by the Department of Justice as well. Um, we also agreed that either party can reopen any part of the policy or the policy in full when we get to successor bargaining. So uh, the, this current contract expires June 30th of 2025, and we go back into bargaining in approximately January of 2025. So about a year and seven months or so from now, we'll be back in bargaining. And so we made it clear that either party can reopen this policy at that time. That, I think, is my summary. I hope that's not too much, and I hope that was helpful to folks. And I'll look in the chat and try to answer some questions while 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 you, while I turn it back to you, Pastor. I, mean, I always say thank you for us who are not so legally minded, but you have given it to us in the best language. Um, our um, goal here uh, to everyone 
is to bring information um, and make it clear as possible uh, and hear it straight from uh, those who are working um, in this settlement agreement and in this um, policy of directive. Again, um, it is a new directive. I believe you can find it starting at, uh, is it the 1100 series, 11? I'm not sure where body-worn camera procedure 1.10. Is that how you would look for it in the directives, Heidi? It's So I don't think it's in there yet because we just agreed on it. Um, so the Bureau, their policy director who drafts all the policies and puts them through the process, they're working on that right now. Okay, but we'll it let you know probably go there. under the use of force area more. It's somewhere in that area directive, possibly. I'm not sure if it'll be there or if it could be under conduct. Uh, I, I will not guess on that. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll leave it to them, those who do that. Um, there was a question from Ann. Ann, um, did you want to chime yes. in? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Heidi. As always, great to see you here. And you're so clear in your uh, sharing of information. I did have two quick questions. Um, you, no you noted that body-worn cameras will not be turned on in protests. I have concern about that because, as we all know, in the protests of 2020, we, the city, I believe, still has a number of cases, maybe a thousand or two thousand or more cases pending regarding use of force during protests. So if we're not going to turn them on, if we have protests again, I'm concerned about that. And then um, I just for clarification, officers can review the tape, their tape, body worn camera tape. Um, before they write reports on level three and level four. Is that correct? Yeah, after they give the full, so I'm gonna start with your second question first. Um, after they, and Anne, it's always great to see you too, <laughs> thanks. Um, after the officer gives the full and candid account on scene to the supervisor, then they can review the footage and write their report, but they can't do it before. But that the, the difference between that on category three and four versus category two is on the category two use of force that will be recorded on the body camera footage versus the statements made on categories three and four uses of force. They will just they will be as they have been, which is not recorded. They occur, but they're not recorded currently. And then on the protest, to be clear, so they are required to turn on their cameras during a protest event to the extent allowed by law. That was the, we we had to put that in there and DOJ, um, which we greatly appreciated, uh, uh, approved that language. And that's because there is currently a law that prohibits um, police from um, recording officer, uh, excuse me, recording members of the public when they're engaged in protest events. And so, except if they're um, committing a crime or there's reasonable suspicion or probable cause to believe a crime has occurred. And so uh, what, we, uh, what we said was that they will turn on their cameras during protest events to the extent allowed by law. And there's um, currently been discussion down in the legislature about are there some edits we could make to that um, so that body camera footage could be more readily used during those events? And that's still in process. So I, I'm not sure where it will land at the end, but, um, but that's a state law prohibition. And so they'll be required to turn them on as long as to the extent we're allowed to do so by law. We'd, we'd like them on too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ann. Dory, if I can have you to help me look at some of these questions in the chat as well as I go through. Um, I did want to ask um, Heidi, um, mentioning in category, I believe category two, um, the cameras will be turned on when they're talking to their supervisor. I just was a little, want to get a little more clarity on that. When they're making their statement, 
um, they're able to talk with the supervisor. The supervisor is able to have the camera on. At that point, I kind of got lost in that. And I wrote it down when you said they can turn it on when talking with the supervisor and then uh, review the, their statement. Is that how that was? Right. So for the category two uses of force. So for any use of force, the supervisor is always called to the scene. So the supervisor goes out and they're required currently to perform an after action review of the force that's used. And in that review, part of that, so they go there, they talk to witnesses, they gather evidence about the use of force event, and they interview the involved officer. So currently they are required, the officer is required to give a full and candid account of what occurred to the supervisor, but it's not recorded. So now what will be required is when they give that full and candid account to the supervisor on the scene where the use of force occurred, the supervisor will have their camera on and record that interaction and the statement. We also said if the officer wants to turn their camera on to record their own statement, they're welcome to do that. I, I thank you for that clarity. Um because it just took my mind back to the Aaron Campbell scene. And I think that that added piece uh, does, again, uh, really opens up more of what's going on in the scene at that point. Uh, Dory, was there? Uh, so Rochelle Silver in the chat asked, can you please talk about plans for the evaluation of the pilot project? So part of the contract with Exxon is that they are providing um, at no charge some 170 cameras to for the city and the bureau to try and see how the body cameras work. And during that pilot, they will be required to use the cameras consistent with, with the policy that I just described to you. At the end of that time, um, the city and the PPA will come back together, the city and the union will come back together and discuss if there were issues with how the policy worked with the during the pilot program. And if there was were concerns and some things that we mutually agree on to change, we can change them. Similarly, DOJ provided an approval, and I'll let Jared um addresses, but I just wanted to say he DOJ provided an approval and they will reassess it at the end of the pilot program as well. And I can let Jared talk about that piece more. Um, but but the I do want to be clear that the city cannot require the policy to get reopened and negotiated until successor bargaining, which as I said will not start until will start in about a year and in eight months. And then and then the if in and then there's a whole process, a uh, procurement process to enter into an actual contract to purchase body cameras for the entire bureau and all the equipment that is associated with it, as well as the cloud storage, which has the auditing ability, all that, all that comes with the body cameras and the and the purchase of those through Axon, that contract will need to be negotiated after the pilot program. And the chief procurement officer will be required to bring that back to council for consideration before a final contract is entered into with Axon. Excellent. Um, well, this gives us, so we're staying on time base time point. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, us to be able to, again, ask Jared, if he doesn't mind uh, sharing with us. Um, I did hear at the council meeting of all of the working parties that worked hard from the all of the commissioners that were involved and the whole team of people that were pretty much um, comfortable with uh, working and getting to this place here. And Jared, uh, if you don't mind um, talking to us a little bit more about what you see uh, that could help ensure uh, some of this for the public or the community to feel 
uh, in the align with the settlement agreement of what was presented. Could you do that for us, Jerry? Uh, I can, can try, uh, Pastor can I, Weiser. Can I jump in? I don't mean to interrupt. I see that Gloria has her hand up. Okay. We didn't see that. Gloria? Yes. My question was for Heidi. Hello, Heidi. It's good to see you. Hi, Gloria. Great to see you, too. I, I had a question about the intentional... Uh, who, who determines the intentional response? Um, if the sorry. officer's response is intentional or if it was just a mistake that he made, who determines that? Well, I, um, well, let me put it this way. I think initially management would make a determination. So the city would make a determination if they believed it was intentional. Um, and then we would have to prove that. So I, th I think if the union disagreed with the city on it, then they could grieve that and argue that it was not intentional. I think some of the things we talked about were, let's say somebody uh, forgets to turn their camera on five, six times in a short period of time. At some point, you start thinking it becomes intentional, right? Like, like we told you so many times, even if it's still within the 60-day period, um, you know, it's at some point if if their supervisor keeps having to tell them the same thing again and again and again and again, you start wondering if it's intentional. So I think there were we we contemplated there might but might be those extreme against. But more importantly, were let's say let's say somebody um, an intentional error might be uh, the officer looked at their body camera footage um, for a category two use of force prior to giving their statement. That would be an intentional violation of that policy that we would absolutely um, proceed proceed on them. I'm sure there's others. I'm just not. That's just the one that came to my mind as 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 one of as an obvious example of where we would where we would um, you know hold them accountable for that. Good. I'm Thank sorry, you. Gloria. I apologize, Gloria. I didn't see your hand there. That's okay. Uh, we'll turn. Is there any other? Was there any other questions, Dory? I did not, or any other hands. I think, um, in the interest of of including all of our invited speakers on this subject, we can move along. Okay. And we'll turn this portion, uh, Jared. Uh, thank you, Pastor Weisner, and and thanks to everyone on the committee. Uh, I want to just take a, a few moments so that uh, Dr. Haynes has uh, plenty of time to, to be heard. Uh, to answer your question, Pastor Weisner, the settlement agreement does give the Department of Justice a uh, review and approval authority over all policies related to uh, the settlement agreement, including expressly uh, the policy that is uh, the result of collective bargaining uh, regarding body cameras. Uh, we've issued a letter of approval for the pilot program. I copied that into the chat. Um, as part of that, you know, we will have to go through uh, an evaluation of the program, just like the union and the city, uh, to see if there are any operational difficulties. And for our purpose, uh, we want to ensure that this program uh, is an effective remedy uh, for the non-compliance that we noticed back in 2021. Uh, and so in, in regards to that, there are a couple of, of key factors. Uh, as Heidi mentioned, nothing in this body-worn camera program or in the remedy of a body-worn camera program is meant to dilute uh, existing provision. So if uh, experience shows through the pilot project that there are some aspects of the settlement agreement that are not being complied with, that would be something that we would be concerned with and we would want to work with the city and the union to find a way uh, to, to button that up or to ensure that the uh, remedy is additive, not uh, a substitution of existing uh, rights and responsibilities uh, laid out. Uh, I, I, you know, just as an overarching matter, I, I do appreciate that this compromise was made by the city and the union. At the last court hearing, uh, we uh, identified some remarks to the court 
just in terms of the diametric opposition of the union and the city where the union was saying we should always get to pre-review our camera and the city saying you should never uh, uh, be allowed to uh, look at your camera footage before writing a report. And this truly is a middle ground and it's a middle ground that even though it doesn't hew uh, precisely to the principles that we thought would be an adequate remedy for the non-compliance, uh, it was the only issue where the city and the union were in dispute. And, uh, you know, we're talking about a, a subset of cases. So we're, we're pleased with the fact that the city and the union were able to come to an agreement because we, we do believe strongly that the remedy uh, afforded by body-worn cameras is uh, better if it's out on the street sooner rather than later. And there were a, a host of... Uh, potentialities if the city and union proceeded to arbitration, got a decision. Uh, there, there could have been spinoff litigation in state court and in federal court. Uh, those processes each have respected rights of appeal. And we really could have been looking at a delay in this program of, of several years. And uh, so in that respect, we are, uh, you know, proceeding, you know, with a policy approval for this pilot. Uh, the city and the union have reserved rights to continue bargaining and to modify this uh, policy. And so we've also reserved our rights under paragraph 194 of the settlement agreement to evaluate the final program because we are interested in the final program. Obviously, you have to have a pilot uh, in order to see how uh, this works on the street. And we will evaluate that along with the city and the union and hopefully together uh, to see where there were um, you know, hurdles or unforeseen uh, obstacles uh, to rolling out this remedy. So it is a true remedy for accountability. Um, and with that, I, I hope that gives um, you know, the public some faith in the process, uh, just in terms that it's not uh, without oversight. Um, Judge Simon is still seized of the case. The Department of Justice is still seized of the case and the issue, and we will see how it works on the street. It's, you know, at some point you reach the end of being able to theoretically imagine how this is, is going to work on. And uh, so in that regard, we're, we're pleased with the pilot program. Um, you know, that's all the remarks. Uh, the letter speaks for itself. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them here about our letter of approval or uh, answer them offline. But, you know, in the interest of time uh, and, and, you know, Dr. Haynes giving up his time to be here, uh, I'll yield uh, any other time I have to, to him. Well, we thank you, Jared. Again, I do know and I've heard uh, that um, I believe uh, looking for the best uh, pilot or the best way to go from Seattle or around the country, um, your eyes on it have given uh, assurance somewhat to come back even evaluating what is there for us to continue to um, make it better uh, for the Portland side. Portland, um, But we thank you again. I do appreciate the letter. I didn't get a chance to read it. As many of us um, who received um, the uh, news that the approval had moved forward. It was really kind of fast for a lot of people, but we're glad that we're able to do this here at PSEP and bring people the opportunity to hear more. Uh, leading there, I would uh, like to take this time and uh, ask my co-chair if she had any thoughts at this point with Jared. No, and I uh, I thank you for uh, the presentation tonight, Heidi and Jared, and um, I'm interested in hearing more from the community as as we go through the meeting. And in the efforts of time or respect of time, I want to make sure that, uh, that Dr. Haynes does get time. So I'm wondering if we could, um, I can't remember our schedule in the break, but give some of our time uh, so that we could extend uh, this session and discussion about this a little bit into our next one, talking about contact surveys. So um, we could maybe just push our break out a little bit more. That's thank what you. I'm suggesting. And I thank you, Anne, for taking uh, note of how much information is out here uh, and much as we're trying to um, 
keep according to schedule and then respectfully to those uh, who are here presenting as well, which leads me back to uh, the opportunity. We know Dr. Haynes has a very busy schedule. Um, he is in his state, uh, his conference, uh, he does more than just be a local pastor, but he covers many areas of the Alaska part of the country. And then of course, we've had a, to take a moment uh, to everyone and address, uh, we had a um, one of our pastors in the city who has been doing a great job here at one of the churches, New Hope, who was suddenly passed away and Dr. Haynes as well was there. Uh, so coming in today to uh, do what he usually do, I, I, I remember marching with Dr. Haynes and asking him, Dr. Haynes, how old are you? And he looked at me and he said, why? I said, because I hope I can do it as long as you do. <laughs> and he was marching over miles. So at this point, uh, Dr. Haynes, um, we know uh, we've heard uh, from both the city as well, uh, but we also heard you speak at the um, uh, the city hall council meeting of uh, for AMA um, Coalition, AMAC. Uh, many may not know exactly what that is, but again, we're going to give you enough time to bring um, that information as well, Dr. Haynes, of some of the things after you reviewed, uh, are some of the things that are needing to see uh, from the community of the uh, oversight side. Dr. Haynes? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to join and to share in this dialogue and discussion. I want to thank both the, um, the city and the union and uh, uh, for the work that they have done. Um, I would um, want to say, um, um, as president of the uh, Abana Ministerial Alliance, the oldest minister alliance in the North and Northeast community, and the chairperson of the Abana Minister Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. Uh, and just give you a, 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 just a shout thing, the AMA Coalition for Justice and Police Reform was the lead a proponent of bringing the Department of Justice uh, into this city to conduct a, uh, a federal audit for the Portland Police Bureau that led to the uh, settlement agreement uh, uh, in federal court. And this uh, um, came out of the context and all of this come out of the context of uh, um, uh, what we consider to be unjustified uh, uh, police shootings that have taken place uh, uh, against um, uh, Black persons, people, um, community of colors, and the mentally ill. Um, and so in the context, uh, we, we bring even before since 2008 with Kendra James case and on, uh, a lot of expertise and experience of doing the uh, working with these. In fact, most of the contemporary directors uh, of the police department actually came out of challenges from the uh, 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 Obama Ministry Alliance Coalition for Justice and uh, Police Reform and the training uh, of the Portland Police uh, and this de escalation. And so what I'm saying is that uh, we have uh, been at this thing for a while. There's not uh, any, anything new for us. Now on the issue of the body cam uh, that um, I, when I spoke at the uh, city council meeting, um, we wanted to say, first of all, that we are, we are self to use uh, the police body cam as a uh, an accountability means to uh, uh, help build uh, trust in the community, uh, and that is would be beneficial both for the uh, police officer as well as the uh, community. Um, but there are some uh, areas of the policy that we have 
concern about um, um, after commending both the city of Portland and also the uh, Department of Justice and the uh, amicus, um, um, we see that there's a issue for us on the um, um, review of the video prior to the writing of the initial incidents um, um, that we consider this be, and our legal team consider this to be only a, a, uh, um, a, a partial prohibition. It's not a full report. And why do we define it as a partial prohibition? Because the the uh, officer uh, uh, in, uh, in the initial incident report uh, is able to uh, um, give their uh, partial review uh, and then they are able to uh, see the video and, and uh, finish their report. Now, this came out of the context of, uh, of several different cases uh, that uh, well, do uh, Senator Abel Godley, we've been able to uh, have transcripts of cases that uh, um, when she was an active senator that came down that the district attorney allow us to have uh, uh, um, those tra transcripts of grand jury cases. And we we're, were able to compare over a period of time in, and in different shootings like uh, uh, Kendra James, like uh, uh, Aaron Campbell, uh, 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 Keaton Oldies, uh, 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 James Chassie cases, that God. there were, there were uh, initial incidents report, but when the officer was uh, in term in the grand jury, there was a, uh, a totally uh, contradiction of those incident reports. So there's a history uh, in the Portland Police Bureau of telling uh, one story in the incident report and then telling uh, another story in the grand jury. And we have the um, transcripts to prove that as well as the incident reports, you know. And that was one of the contextualization reasons why we uh, felt that the, the, uh, the full incident report uh, needed to be seen um, uh, before the uh, officer see the video. video. So we have a, a, the, the present contract that has come out to the negotiation is, is only a partial, uh, and, and then there's a, the questions that I asked in the incident report, it allows the officer. And really a lot of this came out of the uh, 2008 in the uh, Ken James case where officers were recorded by the Dallas Morning News to uh, getting together at Applebee's on uh, 15th Street and the corner of the Law Center and uh, getting their reports together and say, you say this and I say that and that. So, and and uh, along with that, um, there was no 48 hour rule before the uh, MA coalition uh, pushed for a father because it took two weeks and sometimes three weeks before there was an interview uh, from the officers. And, and so, all of this has taken place in, in a context. These, these directives and uh, training didn't just come out of the uh, blue uh, sky or drop from the heaven. They came out of actually uh, uh, live cases that existed over the period of time to the present where we are. So we, we say that the policy section in section 1.1.2.2 uh, and our understanding and our legal understanding allow officers to review body footage cameras uh, after only doing a partial incident statement 
and, and there needs to be more clarification uh, to this definition and the process. Um, two, we have concern about the process of uh, dealing with the uses of the video and the process of the discipline action, you know, the um, matrix of the discipline, which came out of the, um, the pushing by the AMAC coalition and the settlement uh, agreement. There are concerns about that that takes place. Uh, and a lot of those of, of the, the process that's taken place that remind us of the Department of uh, Justice uh, uh, when they called the, um, the complaint system that we had previously as a, uh, uh, a medieval archaic system in, in, the, in the whole process of dealing with the uh, complaint. We also recommend three that the, that the city auditor an independent auditor should be the one to do an annual audit of the effectiveness of the policies and the review. Uh, and fourth, um, we're concerned that uh, the present thing does not allow the internal affairs investigation to review the uh, footage before the involved officer review the footage. Uh, this is a deviation from uh, uh, best practices and personnel uh, investigation. And so a question also arises in that fourth point is whether uh, this will impact the new police oversight board conducting investigation. Will their, will their investigators be allowed to uh, um, um, see the uh, uh, video footage before the, uh, they ask questions of the officers. Now we put all of this in context of what we have learned and we are still learning over the time. And it, and it reminds me of the recent um, 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 brutality and killing in Memphis, Tennessee. Very clearly we have information now and it's very public that the officers cut off their um, um, uh, um, body cam during the, uh, the uh, beating of the uh, young man to death, you know, and, uh, and this, this was a big issue. And then when they, when some that did show footage, uh, there was the issue of, uh, in Memphis, of uh, the footage contradicting their incident report. And so um, what we were saying here is there's, there's some lessons to be learned. And if we're gonna get credibility and, and trust in the community, uh, um, when, they, when they see incidents like what happened in Memphis and, and, and the possibility of something similar happening here, um, hope not with the grace of God again, but uh, that, that, that these things, are, uh, we, don't, we don't have to keep uh, what, over and over again, making the uh, same mistakes over again. But we are uh, certainly in support of the uh, uh, police body cam, but uh, uh, policy is critically important. It's not enough to say we don't have uh, body cams, but having the right policy uh, is uh, critically important, you know, and I, and I think it can serve the interests of both the police officers and well as the community, uh, and and that we can get uh, moving forward towards 21st century uh, policing that would benefit our whole uh, uh, city, this great city of Portland. Thank you very much. Dr. Haynes, again, we want to thank you uh, for bringing us up to speed. Um, but I always take and underline certain things, such as how strong policies 
are to be observed. And uh, again, it is strongly said that we want good policing, but those policies are written so that again, um, that we are able to hold them accountable and make sure that the trust, because again, noticing what happened in Memphis, um, the cameras didn't stop them. Mm -hmm. And we need just be decent people. Just really should be mm -hmm. decent people. And I, um, I think I don't want to go into my box just for time's sake. I'm going to hold my, my, my opinion here because I'm very touched by you and your words. Um, and again, uh, I want to commend uh, our group because we felt, and and my co-chair here, that this was an important topic and it should fall under the settlement policy area that we can be able to come back and be effective uh, what we're hearing and how to strongly support um, as the uh, piece of what we are assembled for to be strong uh, with the um, agreement and settlement and community. Uh, and is there anything for time's sake? I noticed uh, we did move our next agenda to 715. Uh, we will take, I see uh, the team well, up there. Um, yeah, I, wanna, I don't mean to interrupt. I know that we have a, a number of invited guests and Dr. Rosen, uh, is, uh, Rosenbaum is one of our invited guests. I want to make sure we have enough time. I suggest we take a five minute break and come back uh, and then just start off uh, then. And, and then if we have time at the end of our meeting, um, I want to thank all our presenters as you did as well. And if anyone has any additional questions that we hope to have time at the end of our meeting this evening to address anything that came up. So uh, let's take a five minute. I would like to also take a moment for our other committee members if there's anything that we missed that they may want to hear very quickly uh, from them. Well, as well. well, can we maybe hold that to the end so that we can make sure that we have time for um, like our next question? Yeah. Sounds good. Five minute break, everyone. Thank you. All right. Yeah. We'll be back here at uh, 723 or 22. Yeah. See you all soon. And, and recording we'll stopped. Apart.
Um, and I think for this section, we have Anne leading the charge. Um, if Anne is back with us. That is correct. Is there Thank you oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. yes, I'm here. Thank you all for being here. Um, and continuing with our meeting and thank you again to our presenters for the first half on body worn cameras. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Uh, PCEP's mission is to impart help PPB increase community trust. I know that uh, Pastor Wisner talked about that this evening uh, in relation to body worn cameras. Um, and I know that Dr. Rosenbaum has spoken about contact surveys as long as I've been a PSEP member, uh, various meetings in, very, in many different reports. And, and recently at a COCO report, he spoke about it. And I, um, I agree with him wholeheartedly um, and would like to see this uh, happen in our community. It makes me think about whenever you go to a doctor's office or, or sometimes when you buy something, you get a, a, um, a survey. And I think that would, uh, and in talking to community members and listening to community members over the last few years, I think it would also help um, our transparency um, of our uh, police officers to hear the feedback uh, and possibly create new uh, new ways of, of operating. Um, and I know PSEP has been uh, asking that as long as I've been here. Uh, for instance, we did during the protests, we asked for a, um, a report, best practices, what did you learn? What are you gonna do differently? Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't received that yet, but uh, hopefully that will come soon. So tonight we'd like to uh, have Dr. Rosenbaum talk about uh, contact surveys and kind of give us um, his view with the, the many years he's been here uh, as an independent monitor um, and where he thinks, uh, how he thinks we can maybe move this forward. Um, so, and thank you for coming. And and I'm sorry that we we had to kind of take a little bit more time with the first uh, section of our meeting. But please, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum. No, thank you, Anne. Hopefully, you can hear me. Can you? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, not a problem. I it's, it was so good to see uh, Dr. Haynes too uh, this evening, and all of you. Uh, I'm I am very pleased that the body worn camera program is moving forward, and, uh, I, and that's another one I've been recommending for many years um, as a way to ensure you know that the officers are basically doing what Pastor Weisner called being decent people, and and I think it will make a difference. But uh, moving on to uh, uh, the proposed contact survey program, which I think will have a similar impact, if not even bigger. Uh, I released that report February 1st called Measuring What Matters to the Community, a New Performance Evaluation System. Hopefully some of you have a chance to glance at it. If you haven't, it is posted on our website. Uh, it's nothing new at this point. I've talked about this many times over the years in Portland, but like a lot of things, unless they're required by the settlement agreement, they don't always get put in as a priority. So uh, your agenda lists two questions. So I think I'll respond to those and then open it up. You know, like and, and the way the first one, you know, sort of what is a contact survey? I think Anne kind of summarized already. You're all familiar with contact surveys. They're, they're basically a fancy customer satisfaction survey that you're familiar with when you get them all the time. And uh, but but this time, you know, the issue of did you like the services you got? It, it, we're talking about the Portland Police Bureau. And uh, the surveys, you know, it's only completed by community members who've had a recent contact with the police. And that's like one out of four people in most cities. It's most of us don't have recent contacts with the police. So but these are really the experts, the people with lived experience. So I'm speaking of a form of community engagement here that would engage literally thousands of people every year. These are the people that know about real police contacts and what's involved. They were stopped by the police or they were crime victims who called um, for help or drivers in a traffic accident or people who've been arrested, et cetera. There's all kinds of different groups. Um, 
but so that's what a context survey is. But the second question, how would the context survey further the goals under the settlement agreement was the question you asked. And so I want you to remember, and I think uh, Anne referred to this and uh, others have too, you know, if you read the first two pages of the settlement agreement, it's all about it's taking action to increase public trust and confidence in the Portland Police Bureau. So how do we do that? Uh, you know, as I retire here, I, you know, I could write a whole book on how to do it better than we did over the last eight years, but let's be scientific for a moment. That's my approach. I, as, I, as I said at the start of this context survey report, and I'm gonna quote myself here, research clearly shows that police legitimacy and public trust are driven by how the community is treated or mistreated by the police and whether police services are viewed as unbiased, respectful, and compassionate. More specifically, public trust in the police depends heavily on whether the police are acting in a procedurally just manner. We know that from dozens of studies. I've surveyed, surveyed 54 large cities myself. I can document this. So first, we need to measure procedural justice as an outcome to see if the current reforms have had any impact on how community members are treated. Maybe things have gotten better over the last few years, but we don't know. Uh, but secondly, and most importantly, going forward, you should use the context survey data if you start such a program to significantly modify the reform process. In other words, change the reform model. And you need to put the data to work and use it to change the system. We don't just collect it. And what I see happen in many cities over the years, we do a citywide survey, we write a report, and then we forget about it. So let me be specific here. The context survey program I'm suggesting would be run by professionals independent of the police bureau, yeah, but it must be an ongoing, sustainable, multifaceted program that has feedback loops that influence how supervisors evaluate officers' performance, that influence the training for officers and supervisors. It should change how supervisors coach individual officers who perform below standards and, and reward structure for those who perform above standards. In addition, I think community members should also be invited to help assist in procedural justice training for all officers to improve their performance bureau-wide. Now, I know that evaluating individual officers will upset some people, and I'm not going to deal with that right now. We can come back to that issue if you want to later. But let me make a final comment here. So police officers, you know, what I've learned over the years, and this is four decades, I hate to admit how old I am, for studying police in different cities, especially the younger officers, and you're hiring a bunch of them now, they, they want to please their boss, as all of us do in work settings, right? They want to do whatever they're told to do and whatever it takes to be a, get a positive evaluation. So you need to ask yourself, well, how is performance currently evaluated? Is it based on how many tickets you write or how many arrests you make or how many guns or drugs you take off the street? Or are they evaluated by what they haven't done? Is it you know, the number of times an officer stays out of trouble and has no complaints against them. Actually, I was surprised. The Bureau has a very interesting annual performance evaluation system. The metrics they list there are pretty good. There's like 60 of them. But uh, as it turns out, as you've seen in my reports, the supervisors never give officers a needs improvement rating. They never get low scores. So how did the supervisors really know what officers are doing on the streets of Portland? To a large extent, they don't. Uh, they don't ride along every day. So, you know, you desperately need street level data. So you need a new data system, both the contact survey data and the body worn camera data can be put to good use. And, and let me just close by saying one thing here. So as a measurement person, if you measure something, it begins to matter and it takes, it, it's taken seriously by officers. However, if you don't measure something, they don't need to do it. And in fact, management oftentimes in cities, I find they're free to say, yeah, I think we're doing a great job of treating all people with dignity and respect. And, you know, trust me, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Why, how, what's it based on? Anyway, thanks. That's my opening comments. Uh, happy to talk about this. I laid out in the report sort of four steps. You need to get together, decide what should be on the survey, you know, begin to get, there's different ways of getting this survey out to people, but get people involved, it needs to be a priority. And, and uh, I'm not totally sold on the method I suggested using cards by the officers being passed out. There's other ways through text messages to get it out to community members, a short survey, gotta keep it short or the response rate won't be high. 
But uh, anyway, use the data, make it a system. Don't just do a one-time survey and write a report about it. Anyway, that's my open comments. Thanks. Well, thank you, and thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you want to put your what you're referring to, the information you're referring to, a report or something in the chat so that people that are here might be able to click on that if possible. Um, also, um, a quick question I had, or not a quick question, but a question I had, um, many of us know how long it took for us to um, get the body-worn camera or get our community to get the body-worn camera uh, out in, in use in our community. In my mind, uh, in my personal opinion, it had a lot to do with the police union. What do you think your many years, uh, as you noted, almost 40 years uh, doing this work, what do you think, I guess, what do you think the chances of us getting this information, any questions of, of, of anything through the Portland uh, Police uh, Union? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I think the, that's a good question, and every city is challenged by police unions. They're, they're, I'm, I'm a supporter of unions overall in America. I think they've had an important role in the history of American work. Uh, police unions, uh, I, I, over the years, they've, I've run head on into them when it comes to reform many times. So I know I have compassion for what Heidi and others have gone through here. Uh, I think one way around this for now is to not focus on individual officers right away, but to get the system up and rolling and uh, focus on units and precincts and, and overall analysis. You can still get a breakdown. You can say, gosh, most of our officers who score low on this, they are not doing well on uh, you know, giving people a voice. They're make, commanding them to do things and not letting them tell their story. Or maybe it's they're being disrespectful and they're, it's disrespectful by race or by gender identity. You know, think of procedural justice components of it, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar. You have to give people voice. You have to treat them with dignity and respect. You have to treat them fairly regardless of their characteristics by people of color or gender identity or uh, anything. Uh, there can be so many biases in our life. Uh, and, and, and you have to develop a trust with them by showing empathy and compassion. Maybe they score high on some of these things and not others. So one way is to focus on the data first, try to train people around that. But uh, and, and I'm sure I did a, one survey like this in Portland in 2014, and it, it was true. Most officers do quite well. You know, 75% of them get decent rate. People are satisfied with the way the officer treated them. Um, but what about the other 25%? What was going wrong there? You know, uh, and that one, that one did not, not identify individual officers. So that's one way is to start the program, get it started, get some professionals in there, but you got to make it a priority. I mean, I'm coming to the community with this because I didn't have much success, frankly, you know, uh, originally because they, they said it wasn't part of the settlement agreement. So uh, I could have argued that it was. I think it is part of the settlement agreement. I made that a, a deal in my report, but, you know, fine. I, I took that position. I accepted that. That's why I'm coming to the community. If, if you guys decide this is important, I think you can reach compromise. Heidi and others went through a lot of work to reach compromise on the body-worn camera thing. It's still not perfect, as the, as, uh, the Reverend said, uh, Doctor, And uh, but it's a lot better than nothing, so... Thank you. I really appreciate um, you telling us about this, telling us to follow the data um, and to train off of that. I want to know if anyone has any questions um, that you'd like to ask. I'm looking. I don't see any hands raised. Can I make one more statement? There, there's and, Tia's hand also. I, I'll just make a quick statement that I, I really don't really want to be clear about this. I, you know, I don't want this to be a punitive thing for officers where we're going after individual officers who are performing lowly. I want it to be for coaching and helping them reach a certain level. Interpersonal communication skills are so important. 
They should be trained on more and more. You'll see that in our reports. I've been pushing for more equity training, more procedural justice training. I'll be in Portland in a couple of weeks. I'm going to meet with the training division and talk about this. Uh, but my point being that uh, it doesn't have, people don't need to get defensive about this. It should be helpful for them. It should be a way to improve performance and gain public trust and cooperation. Their job is much easier if you can talk people into handcuffs than if you force them into handcuffs. There's a lot of ways this can be done. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and uh, Tia? You're on mute, Tia. Still can't. Here we go. Okay. There okay. We go. I'm on my cell phone because my laptop died. Ugh, I'm having technical difficulties. I would really like to see this happen because um, people I've talked to in my communities, I think really deserve a voice after having contact with police officers. Um, no matter what happens, it's just, um, will help them have a voice in their interaction. And um, not knowing where to go with, with the interaction they had, whether it was positive or negative. Um, and I'm wondering, you're talking about this as if it isn't in existence right now, is that correct? You're trying, you want to launch something like this? That, that's correct. It doesn't exist as a system of data collection. It doesn't exist yet in any large department. It has a few small departments back east that are doing this, but uh, you know, I did it in 53 large cities and all the I surveyed the chiefs afterwards and they all said, this is a great idea. We love this. The problem is they didn't implement it as a system. It was just a one-time survey. What entity do you feel like would be good in creating something like this? Would it come out of the what, uh, what, what entity do you feel would be good in implementing something like this? A committee, someone in the city? I think you need like someone outside the police. I, I said in my report, I think the community safety division is a possibility out of the mayor's office. Somebody, they could also though hire some outside experts to collect the data, manage it. It needs to produce reports all the time that get fed back to supervisors and others so they can you know, improve behavior. So, but I think that something like that, again, it is a, you have to put some, a person, you have to have a person to run it. You have to put a little money into this. You know, it's not, it's not free, but once you get it up and going, it should just be part of city government. Yes, I'm in agreement. I just don't know where to go from here. Well, I know it's being recommended by other people. I see Nathan has his hand up. I know that the TAC, which he is on, is also, um, I think, behind us, but maybe not. I should think. Uh, yeah. Yes, I see Dory's hand up and then Nathan. Yeah, I just wanted to elevate a question from the chat um, because I think uh, other people might, I think more than one person might have this question. Could you, Dr. Rosenbaum, again, just say, um, and maybe in with a little more context, what is a contact survey and, and who uses it, who takes it, what is it, you know, just, just, yeah. Sure. Real quickly. So like a customer said, within a week, hopefully of the time that you have a contact with a Portland police officer, you will be given an invitation to complete a survey. Well, through a text message or through a card that the officer gives you, and and you will go online uh, or text message, and you will do a short survey that measures some of these things I just talked about. Was the officer respectful? Did the officer show any you know uh, treat you with uh, you know? Did the officer give you a chance to explain the story? Did the officer explain what happened? Basic questions. That so it's individuals. There they will be remain anonymous, so nobody knows who they are, but they'll be linked to a particular police report in a particular case. Is that, is that better? Yeah, I think I think that clears things up. And your recommendation is that that survey be managed by a third party um, outside of uh, PPB in this case. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, that group, I, I thought I saw a comment that said the group I just mentioned is not part of the mayor's office, so I apologize. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Nathan, and then uh, Dr. Allen and and Gloria. After that, thanks, Anne. And I, I did just want to you know clarify something. Um, this did you know come up before TAC. Um, one of the challenges, and I think this is going to be relevant to PSEP's discussion. One of the the challenges with this conversation is that there are a lot of very specific implementation details to figure out with any contact survey program. Um, and you know, my personal view is that there is a you know very broad range of designs and, and choices that are you know acceptable that would still produce you know a lot of value and, and solve a lot of problems for our community. And so I want to encourage um, peace up when we consider this. Uh, well, I guess I should say I want to encourage PSEP to, to recommend that the city moves forward um, and, you know, and really push hard for this. Um, but I also don't want us to get too bogged down in, in you know, specific details. Uh, we have a lot of great people working uh, for the city um, who I think could could take on this effort and do a really good job with it. Um, you know, the, the specific recommendation that Dr. Rosenbaum laid out has a lot of great um, Great specific details, and it's a great starting point. Um, but I, I hope we can, you know, get behind this and, and really drive this forward. Um, one of the challenges is this did come before uh, the training advisory council, um, but that conversation got bogged down in some of the details, and that wasn't ever um, the TAC didn't end up making a recommendation uh, at least so far. Um, so, so that's just my thought. And I, again, just to be very clear, I'm I'm 100% in support of this. Um, and I especially want to call out the concept of procedural justice, uh, which is going beyond not just the, you know, the laws of, of how people are being treated by officers, but also, you know, are you, you know, does the community member feel respected? Do they have voice in the encounter? Are they treated well? Um, you know, I think that's just so important. And I, I think if more um, Portlanders and Portland community members understood those concepts, they would be, you know, strongly in support of them as well. Um, so again, you know, thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum, for producing this report, and um, I really hope this gets some traction. Uh, thank, thank you, Nathan. I agree with everything you said in terms of it, there are details to be worked out, but a, a group of people in Portland, there's so many talented people working for the city and on these advisory groups that they could easily shape it to be what you need need it to be. But you know, hopefully, you can keep the ball moving. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Dr. Allen? Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, do you see a role for the legislature in the use of the data such a system would collect? Wow. Uh, I never really thought about it at that level. Uh, I, I was seeing this more as uh, something for Portland, but, um, you know, it. Uh, everything's, I guess, open. <laughs> Did the legislature have a role in any of the other cities in any of the other states where you tried to do this? No, they did not. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to say one thing about why these some of these things weren't done. And I, I, I mentioned this, I think, in my report, or maybe I said it in a, a response to some problems we had with our report. Um, you know, I've tried the in innovation in this and many other things over the years in many cities, and some of them stick, but t very often people say, boy, what a great idea. That's a wonderful idea. I just wish I had this resources and time and staff to do that. We just don't. And my response to that really is, well, then it's just not really a priority. Because if you really cared and you really thought this was important, you'd find the staff and the time and the resources to make it happen. So I don't want to be mean to anybody, but I, I just see that pattern. I've seen it many times. I could write a whole book about it. Um, and so I think, you know, the community has to step up and say, no, this is important to us. If it's not, fine. Um, but the legislature thing, I mean, do you want to make it something for the whole state? I, I want this to be a, actually a national initiative at some point. We did a national project in 100 American cities, including Portland. And... Uh, I was hoping the whole set of metrics, just like you have the uniform crime reports that tell you whether Portland has more or less crime than Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, you, you should have a procedural justice. You should know 
where your city compares with similar sized cities with similar crime rates and similar problems. So someday, that's my dream. <laughs> Go national, I think the legislature has to care about the data. That could be, yeah. Good point. Thank you. Uh, Gloria? You're on mute, Gloria. A mute. Can you hear me now? Hi, Gloria. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. I really appreciate this. I've been fascinated with the idea ever since you introduced it to us last year. I, um, I think it would be an excellent measurement tool. You know, every workshop, every seminar, everything that I have ever participated in, at the end of the session, they always give you a measurement tool. And that measurement tool lets you know if you want to do it again, what was good about it, what you appreciate it. And that's the means for them calling the speaker back. I would think that Portland Police Bureau would just jump on this if for nothing else but to use it internally so that they could measure how they progress over a period of time. And if the measurement was a good tool and it showed good results, uh, contrary to what we've been seeing in the news, it's something that could be invaluable, I think. Thank you, Thank yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Well, I, I agree. And I think Portland could take the lead and be the, uh, the shining light that's a model for other large cities, you know, there's no reason that can't happen. And uh, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for one of those things. And by the way, this is, you had the body-worn camera discussion. These two are kind of two data sets about what goes on on the streets. They could be connected in some ways as well, in the sense that well, here are the cases that, where the community is not happy with what happened. And they, they're kind of articulating that in the survey, but let's go look at the body-worn camera data and see how it links up with that. There'll be patterns. I've suggested that the body-worn camera data have software like Trulia that mm -hmm. analyzes every time things happen, that there's certain words used and things get tense and escalate. Supervisors can't do that. They, but this, these software programs can analyze thousands of hours of data and instantly tell you that, you know, at this hour, this happened and with this case. And uh, so anyway, they're, they're all kind of connected. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Jay? Hey, um, Jay, I'm, uh, I'm actually on the Police Accountability Commission, but I'm not here on behalf of them or anything. But um, I was just curious about um, how people would be receiving the survey? Is it like through something in the mail? And I was also curious about um, thinking about, you know, uh, you know, all these generations that are digital natives now, you know, they're not going to fill nothing out <laughs> on a piece of paper and they're not going to send anything back. Um, so is there any digital means of administering the survey, you know, through text yes. or links or anything like that? Yes. So although in this, in the report I wrote, I proposed, Chicago, Portland's one of the places that where officers are required to pass out these cards. Uh, I don't know if they pass. You could have a code on there where they just take a picture and that's the survey from their phone. That's what I was suggesting. However, others have suggested other things. There's an issue there. Do they pass out the, all the cards all the time? You know, if they have a bad encounter, will they not pass the card out? I have some experience in one city that says that some won't do that. Uh, but anyway, another option is, and I think this is might even be a better option, is if there's phone numbers connected to police reports that they just get a text message. And that, and you can do the short survey with your phone. In, in other cities, I gave an option of doing a 1-800 number where it's an automated voice, AI intelligence, scary as it is today. Uh, this person would say, if the officer was polite, press one. If the officer was not polite, press two. You know, <laughs> so it had that kind of verse. And, and I, 
10 years ago when I was more into this stuff, I found that that was helpful to close the digital divide. divide. African-American communities were more inclined sometimes to use the 1-800 phone number. Uh, but today, I think, especially the young people, remember, there's a lot of cell phones. So I don't think that, and that's a little more expensive, adding that option. And But then they, they mailed a letter out from these other cities, including Portland, from the police chief saying, you had a recent encounter with one of my officers. Would you please either go online, do this survey at this link, or do this 1-800 number? That was the two choices. I'm not suggesting either of those right now. I'm suggesting you reach out to them directly without mailing out physical letters and all that stuff. So hope that helps a little. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to bring up um, something that you said at the beginning that an outside agency would would uh, carry this out. And then there was some discussion about maybe a bureau within the city. I personally think it should be independent of the city uh, to get the best results. Um, and then I think it's important as I'm I know you've noted to have this anonymous because, uh, you know, people can feel uh, like it's not safe for them to to take a survey of this kind. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I totally agree with the anonymous part. Um, I part of me feels that the you, there are some very competent people in the city that could handle this as long as they're independent of the police bureau. Uh, I wouldn't want the, a lot of people say, just let the police bureau manage. And I'm like, no, even though they have good analysts and some very talented people there, there's a distrust issue with that. So, uh, but I do think uh, there are people that uh, are very competent in the city. So I, that's something you guys have to, to work out. But I, I, anyway, that's my opinion. <clears throat> But and they would even hire an outside group to manage some of the data, you know, or bring in somebody to do that. So there's maybe a data management company, but there's also an individual who's responsible for producing the reports that by by for for the city to use. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have a question, Pastor Wisner? Do you have anything that you'd like to add? Only thing I am, I'm really just, you know, I'm not the genius and Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, I'm not using genius as you are the genius and you're not a genius, but the common sense of all of this is what I'm saying as people and understanding where and what makes everything accountable to what we all are um, hoping to have a better community uh, to use as a, um, a governing piece of, you know, just being accountable for a job that is needing to be and with the magnitude of where that we give this type of legal authority and 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 deadly use of uh, force um, to have a community to talk about their encounter without the fear uh, of who is stopping them uh, mind blowing, mind blowing, sister. And I just uh, again, I am appreciating our group as we always are here to inform and discuss. Uh, to be able to again, I think Nathan and and others have made it strong enough, even with the body worn cameras, that this taking this opportunity to go back to the full committee um, and. Uh, begin to see what recommendations should look like. Um, and then uh, co-chair Ann, um, uh, I'm always in support of your, your ideals of what we uh, want to try to bring in the policy of the settlement. Sounds good. Yeah, I just want to say if you can, uh, following up what you're saying, yes, and if you can incentivize the desired behaviors more, that would be great, you know, in an organization. That's a, a reform model and build that into training and coaching and everything else. I know I would want to be knowing if I'm doing a good job and not know on trying to perform um, promotions or ideal of being moving up. Um, that's the only way you can measure uh, yeah. where a person is at. Yeah. And a great recommendation, Dr. Rosenbaum. 
Yeah, I, yeah. go ahead. Oh, thank you, of course. And I just, you know, go back to something, uh, you know, the union, it would be interesting to see if they would be open to this, because it's been my observation that if they are not open to something like this to be used for coaching or whatever, that it's going to be nearly impossible for us as a community to to work towards implementation. May I also say something that when you mentioned that, I meant to say this in the previous session too, uh, for transparency. Our, um, our invited speakers were pretty heavy for such a topic that we were in and uh, everyone didn't get a um, chance to get a chance to come back and talk about like the union and others that, uh, we did not, uh, I don't think we reached out to, did we, Ann? Uh, so if people are wondering where they're at, no, we didn't. Going on, I just wanted to make that transparent because it was a heavy, heavy uh, schedule, as you can see, for time that was allotted for each speaker. And uh, we can always, again, um, thank Heidi and, and Jared and others if they were able to spend time with more a discussion on this, we can also do that. Well, I think if there's there's any other comments, um, uh, on behalf of PSEP and all the members here tonight and members in our committee, we wanna thank each and every one of you for being here with us in our meeting and special thanks go out to our speakers that came here today and um, Really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, our next meeting, I know that Dory uh, noted it on one of our slides. Dory, what is the next meeting? Um, yes, so we have our community engagement subcommittee meeting next Wednesday. Um, we hope everyone will be able to join us for that. And then um, as a note, this month is a little different for PSEP um, because we will not be having a meeting on the third week of May. Um, we want our members to be able to attend the Cocal Selection Town Hall. Um, so we will uh, you know, be leaving that open so our members can attend and we encourage you to as well. Um, and we'll have information available on our website about that event hosted by the city. Um, and then our four, the fourth week of May, we will be holding a private uh, retreat for PSEP members. So there will also not be a public meeting on the fourth week of May. Um, so we'll keep you posted about upcoming events um, at our website and um, through our update list. Um, but yeah, next, next week we do have a, a meeting. Um, Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much to everyone who presented tonight. A lot of really valuable information shared, some some new ideas, some progress um, shared tonight. Um, thank you to our co-chairs for running a great meeting. Um, and we are right on time. So we can wrap it up here. Um, any, any last words? I'll let our, our co-chairs close it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, no comments from me, but I do thank everyone uh, for helping me to learn more. Everyone that, um, and even the questions from our, our community. I, I want to echo that. And I also want to give extra thanks to Dr. Rosenbaum for his many years of service here in Portland, his eight years of service, I believe. And um, you truly have helped us uh, gain more information about our city and our operations and uh, the data and reports that you've provided to us will live on. Um, and I wish you the very best in your retirement. Thank you very much, Anne. Appreciate it. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, all right. Good night hey, everybody. Dora. Thank you all. Bye. Hey, Dora. Dora. Recording Good night. stopped. Thank you. The recording has stopped. Did you?